This lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about Euclid's proof. This is Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many primes. Um, so most people already know this proof, I'll just review it quickly. Suppose you've got a finite number of primes p1, p2, up to pn. What Euclid does is he takes the product p1, p2, up to pn and then adds 1. And then we take pn plus 1 to be a prime divisor of this. And you notice that pn plus 1 is not equal to p1, p2 up to pn, because if it was, then it would divide 1. So for any finite set of primes, we can find another prime not in the set. So let's just see how this works. <clears throat> we start with the empty set of primes, and we take the product of all primes in the empty set, and the product of an empty set of numbers is by definition equal to 1, so we get 1 plus 1 equals 2. Then our set of primes now has one element, 2, so we take the product of them all, which is just 2, and we get 2 plus 1 equals 3. Then we get 2 times 3 plus 1 equals 7, which is a new prime. And then we get 2 times 3 times 7 plus 1 equals 43, which is a new prime. So we've got lots of primes here, 2, 3, 7, 43. And then we take 2 times... 3 times 7 times 43 plus 1, which is 1807. And this is not prime. But that doesn't matter. What we do is we factorise it. It's equal to 13 times 39. So we get a new prime. Well, we may as well take the smallest one, which is 13. Um, it seems to be a common error by people who think that if you multiply all the primes you've thought of and add one, then that's always prime. But as you see from this example, that's not actually true in general. Um, if you would like to see Euclid's original proof, I've actually um, got a translation of it here. Let's see, maybe I should just, if I just amplify this a bit so you can see it. So Euclid's proof is recognisably the same proof I give here, except, you know, he's, he's just doing the case n equals 3. Euclid often just did the case of three numbers rather than a general case of n numbers because he didn't really have a well-defined concept of proof by induction. So what he would do is he would just work out an example for three numbers and it would leave it to be sort of obvious that that worked for any collection of numbers. Also, he doesn't actually quite multiply them. Um, he just says, um, let the least number measured by A, B, and C be D, E. Well, well, measured by means divisible by. So instead of multiplying them, he's taking the least number that they all divide. And that's because Euclid didn't really have a, um, a really good concept of multiplying several numbers together. And whenever he multiplies several numbers together, he always has this rather, some rather clumsy roundabout way of doing it. I think that's partly because he thought of numbers as being line segments and, you know, you can multiply two line segments together, that gives you a rectangle and has an area, and you can multiply three together and get some sort of solid object which has a volume, but multiplying four or more together is getting a bit doubtful on geometric grounds if you think space is three-dimensional. Anyway, if you look at the, the, the rest of Euclid's proof, it's actually more or less the um, the same proof I gave, and, and perhaps it's in slightly archaic terminology, but it's still the same proof. Um, so the, the next thing I'd better discuss a little bit is what actually is a prime? Let me turn the multiplication down a bit. So what is a prime? Well, we just recall that it's a number p that's only divisible by 1 and p, so we're talking about positive integers, and p should not be equal to 1. So I'm saying 1 is not a prime by definition. So this answers the question, is 1 a prime? The answer is no by definition. 
So people will sometimes argue about whether or not one is a prime. And this is a kind of silly argument because it's defined not to be a prime. Um, the real question is why is it defined not to be a prime? So why do we define one not to be prime? Because, I mean, the definition would be simpler if we actually missed out this, this condition here. Um, well, the answer is it's more convenient. Um, so we're defining one, saying that one isn't a prime, not because it's true that one isn't a prime, but because it's convenient to, to use a definition of prime that excludes one. Let me give some examples. First of all, we have unique factorization into primes. So if you've got a number like 12, it's equal to 2 times 2 times 3, and that's the only way to write it as a product of primes up to order. If we allowed 1 as a prime, then we could write it as 1 times 2 times 2 times 3, or 1 times 1 times 2 times 2 times 3, and this would be rather annoying. Um, so a consequence of that is you can do things like, if you've got a number p and n, then, then we can define the largest power of p, dividing n. For instance, if we take p to be 2 and n to be 12, then the largest power of p dividing 12 is the, is the second power of p. And it's very useful to be able to count how many number of times a prime divides an integer. And again, you couldn't do this if 1 was a prime. Um, a third example, um, a fairly typical example, is um, in the introduction we mentioned the Riemann zeta function which is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on. And this is equal to a product over primes, 1 over 1 minus 2 to the minus s, 1 over 1 minus 3 to the minus s, 1 over 1 minus 5 to the minus s, and so on. And if we allowed 1 to be a prime, then we would get a factor of 1 over 1 to the minus, minus s, which is 1 over 0, which is infinity, which doesn't make any sense at all. So um, so this is fairly typical of many examples where if you allow 1 to be a prime, then you um, would just have to exclude it in your statement of a theorem. Um, there's a sort of philosophical remark about this. Um, we can define words to mean anything we want to mean. We, we just have to be clear about what the definition is. And there is no real point about arguing about the true meaning of a word because it doesn't, no word has a true meaning unless you define it. And words actually often have several meanings. And a lot of arguments in philosophy uh, turn out to be people arguing about the definition of a word, except they don't realise it. For instance, people argue, uh, there's an old question, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it, doesn't make a sound. And people argue endlessly about this. And it's impossible to answer unless you define what a sound is. It might be a vibration in the air or it might be a sensation in your brain, for example. Um, and people sometimes get really emotional about definitions without realising that they're actually arguing about lexicography. Um, so that there are a lot of examples in politics that I not going to mention because I don't want to go around upsetting people. I think the closest I can come is to talk about the question of whether Pluto is a planet. And a few years ago people were getting into quite strong arguments about this. And it's not an argument about Pluto, it's just an argument about the definition of the word planet. I mean people on both sides of the argument about whether Pluto was a planet both agreed on all properties of Pluto and what they were arguing about was not some property of the solar system, but only about a word planet. And it's the same for arguing about whether one is a prime. You're not arguing about a property of numbers, you're just arguing about a, the definition of the word prime. Um, I should say there, there are some, a few mathematicians do actually regard one as a prime, so it's not entirely clear cut, but um, almost everybody in mathematics these days has agreed that one is not a prime. Um, so another question is, is there a nice way to produce primes? So, so Euler's method for showing that there are infinite, so not Euler, Euclid's method for showing there are infinitely many primes will actually produce an infinite number of primes, but it's rather difficult after the first few steps. You start getting very, very big numbers and they're hard to factorise. So we can try and find some other methods. So what happens if we take 
say the product of the first few primes and add one. So we get two times one, two times three plus one is seven. Two times three times five plus one equals 31. Two times three times five times seven plus one is equal to um, two, one, one. And these are all primes. So this sort of looks as if you multiply together the first few primes and add one, then you always get a prime. Well, if we go on a bit, you discover that's not true. So two times three times five times seven times 11 times 13 plus one is 30031, which is 59 times 509. Um, so that doesn't actually work. You know, you know, it's quite plausible that this number is likely to be a prime because you've made it not divisible by a lot of small numbers. So these numbers are certainly more likely than most numbers of about that size to be prime. But as you see, it fails. Um, you should also take note from this that the theory of numbers is a very experimental subject. I mean, um, Good number theorists spend an awful lot of time doing calculations in order to find out what's going on. Th these days, calculations are often done by computer, of course. Um, so that way of generating primes doesn't work. And there seems to be no easy way of generating primes. Um, for example, Euler came up with the following polynomial, x squared plus x plus 41. And if you take x to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, this generates an awful lot of primes. So if x is 0, this is 41. If x is 1, it's 43. If x is 2, it's 47. And if x is 3, it's 53, and so on. And it generates primes all the way up to, I think it's about 39. But for x equals 40, you can see that it's divisible by 41. Um, so this suggests the following problem. Can we find a polynomial p of x that is always prime? I mean, always prime for x and x an integer or maybe a positive integer. Um, well, the answer is actually yes. Um, we can just put p of x equals 2. Kind of a stupid answer. So that obviously wasn't what the question meant. What we should have said was non constant. So is there a non constant polynomial that's always prime? So you can find polynomials that are prime for quite a lot of the time, but um, you see, it's actually obvious that this one isn't prime for all x because we can just put x equals 41 equal to the constant term and then everything will be divisible by 41. So unless the polynomial is constant, it can't always be prime. So that deals with all polynomials um, except ones with the constant term um, equal to 1 or minus 1. But if the constant term is 1 or minus 1, then you can just change the polynomial by, say, adding something to x to make the constant term not equal to 1 or minus 1, and then the previous proof will apply. So there are no polynomials that generate primes apart from completely trivial ones. Uh, and Fermat suggested the following possibility. He suggests the number 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. So the, these are the Fermat primes, as I mentioned in the introduction. And again, for n equals up to about 5, this works. So for n equals, so we get the numbers 3, 5, 17, 2, 57, 6, 5, 5, 3, 7. But after that, um, these numbers have been composite as far as anyone has checked. So for instance, 2 to the 2 to the 6 plus 1 is divisible by 641. And this factor was found by Euler. And this is actually quite impressive if you remember that Euler did not have a computer or a calculator and did all his calculations by hand. So the question is, how did Euler find this factor? Um, well, we'll be explaining a little bit more later on in the course how Euler came up with this factor by hand calculation. So the summary is we just don't know a really easy method of producing very large primes. Um, we, we know some reasonably good methods, but they all involve a fair amount of hard work. There are also several variations of Euclid's proof. So first of all, 
we can find infinitely many primes of the form 2n plus 1. Well, that's completely trivial. That just means odd primes, and they're all odd apart from 2. What about primes of the form, well, instead of 2n plus 1, what about 3n plus 2? Can we find infinitely many primes like that? Well, we can by doing a minor variation of Euler's method. What we do is we take suppose we found lots of primes p1, p2 up to pn. What we do is we multiply them all together and then instead of adding 1 we multiply this by 3 and subtract 1. And let's take pn plus 1 to be a factor of this. And then just as an Euler's proof we can see that pn plus 1 is not equal to p1 up to pn. Next we can ask, is pn plus 1 of the form 3n plus 2? Well, not necessarily. Um, but we can't have all factors of the form 3n plus 1 because the product of any numbers of the form 3n plus 1 is also of the form 3n plus 1. So this is of the form 3... Um, uh, let me use 3m. I don't want this m to be muddled up with that uh, that n. So, so this is of the form 3k minus 2. And you notice the product of any numbers of the form 3m plus 1 is also of the form 3m plus 1. So this must have at least one factor that's not of the form 3m plus 1. And the factor can't be 3 and it can't be one of the primes we first thought of. So the answer is um, sometimes um, one of the factors, well, at least some of the factors must be of this form. So we get an infinite number of primes of the form 3n plus 2. Well, um, how much further can we push this? Well, the same proof works for primes of the form um, 4m plus 3 or 6m plus 5. But beyond that, it doesn't really, they, they don't, I mean, it doesn't seem to work for any other arithmetic progressions, at least not in any easy way. You can go a bit further by using more complicated arguments. Um, here, um, I will do the case that there are infinitely many primes of the form 4m plus 1 by using a variation of Euler's method. Now we need to use the following fact that if p divides a number of the form n squared plus 1 then p equals 2 or p is of the form 4m plus 1 for some n. So you can check this for a few values of n. So we have 2 squared plus 1 is equal to 5, 3 squared plus 1 is equal to 2 times 5, 4 squared plus 1 equals 17, 5 squared plus 1 is equal to 2 times 13. And you see all these numbers are all either 2 or of the form 4m plus 1. So we'll be proving this a bit later, but meanwhile let's just use it to show there are infinitely many primes of the form 4m plus 1. And now we use the following variation of Euler's proof. If we found primes p1 up to pn, um, let me stop using, I'm using the number n too much, let p1 up to pm say, then I square this and add 1 and now take um, p um, m plus 1 dividing this. Then p m plus 1 is a new prime not of the form 4k plus 3 because we said primes of the form 4k plus 3 can't divide 1 plus a square. So we get infinitely many primes 
not of the form 4k plus 3 and the only possibilities are that they are 2 or of the form 4k plus 1. So we find infinitely many primes of the form 4k plus 1 by using a slightly more complicated argument. Um, so you can use the similar argument to show there are infinitely many primes of the form 3k plus 1 or even 5k plus 1 with a, with a little bit more effort. Um, but as far as I know it's still an open problem. Find an easy proof that there are infinitely many primes of the form 5k plus 2. 5k plus 1 you can actually do. Um, this was a, actually first proved by de Richle, um, who who proved more generally that you can find infinitely many primes of the form a k plus b whenever a and b are co-prime. So he showed there are infinitely many primes in arithmetic progression. So we've proved a few simple cases of de Richle's theorem by using variations of Euclid's original proof. Um, but there's no known easy method that works apart from um, these cases and a few more cases. Um, OK, next lecture we'll be covering Euclid's algorithm, which is not really much to do with Euclid's theorem.